appreciate Reverend Munala with me. Good morning, church. God is good and all the time. Amen. Amen. It's, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you uh, for inviting me here, Reverend Sam and the team here at the city. And thank you for the excellent teachings that you have been doing here, uh, the Planted series. Um, there's no better time to be reminded of the reason that we do community, why we are called the people of God, the reason that uh, we were given family uh, to identify with, uh, people that can walk with us uh, through the seasons of life. Um, and, and this has been especially meaningful uh, for, for many of us uh, during this season, uh, the season of uncertainty uh, when we, we're battling um, an enemy from without, this, this terrible pandemic. Um, I think it would be fair to say that, at least for the pastoral team, uh, we have seen more sorrow during this season than any other time. Uh, there's just been lots and lots of sorrow. Uh, and walking with different people um, when they've lost, lost uh, parents, uh, brothers, uh, sisters. It's been difficult, and spouses as well. Um, but again, it's a good time to be reminded um, why we are in this family, the family of God, and why this family makes sense at a time when the rest of the world does not. Uh, I think it's a good time to be planted on the solid rock and to know why it is. Uh, that we believe what we believe. I, I was thinking today, um, I want to do some reading in scripture. Um, and, and the readings uh, that I want to do come from the Old Testament. And I want us to, to mull over the question of what it means uh, to have each other in community. Um, and to ask ourselves a very basic question. What kind of a friend am I? What kind of a friend am I? When you think about the people that God has placed around you, um, today you can say genuinely, you really don't know how long you have those friends. You don't know how long they'll be there. You don't know how long you'll be there. I don't know how long I'll be here. And um, I I've seen people struggle through this question, um, especially when um, this this last wave has come, which is taking away even very young people. And people that you thought that you would do life with for the next 10, 20, 30 years are suddenly taken away from you. It has forced me to ask the question of what kind of a friend am I to those that God has placed around me? Um, am I meaningfully present for them? Um, am I a good friend? Am I a loyal friend? Am I a faithful friend? Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Then he says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend's sake. I believe this is going beyond just a friendship of convenience. It goes beyond me liking your comment on Facebook or Instagram. It, it goes to a much deeper place of doing life, especially when the seasons of life are not convenient, when it is difficult for me to be present for you, when it requires sacrifices on my side or on my part in order for me to be with you where you are. So ask yourself this question, what kind of a friend am I? Again, going back to the Planted series, which forces us um, to re-examine afresh the foundations of the faith where we have each other. I want to read from the book of 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 18. Allow me to do some lengthy reading because much of the text is very self-explanatory. Um, it's not my favorite, obviously, would be the verses before that, the, David and Goliath, you know, uh, and David does exploits for God. But well, that's pretty well known. Um, but there's some, some issues that are captured by the texts that follow that are very interesting. And David is one of those people who will go through difficulties in life. But through those difficulties, he will be tided over by a faithful friendship 
that will endure the test of time. And, and uh, this is what I want us to be challenged by, the quality of friendship and relationship that is possible even in difficult times. And really examine your own relationships, and not just with the people God has put around you, but also with your own siblings, brothers and sisters. The family setting is sometimes the staging place for some of the most difficult relationships, worst conflicts, bitter rivalries. And, and ask yourself, what kind of a brother am I? What kind of a sister am I to my siblings? Am I the peacemaker? Am I the warmonger? Am I the dreaded brother or sister who once they walk in bars, kumearibika, you know, you know there's going to be war in this, in, in this family or in this house today. But really, to examine this in light of not just Jesus' own calling to love one another, but also in light of eternity. When we do funerals, some of the places that I've seen the deepest mournings happen is where regrets exist, where there's no chance to make amends, where you know that you could have had a better relationship, but you did not go out of your way to seek it. Where issues remain pending, where conflicts remain unresolved with no opportunity to make amends. Then people mourn very deeply because the pain of knowing that what has passed can never be undone is difficult to live with. And so I raise this very intentionally asking you to re-examine again the basis on which we are living our lives or living out the command, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. What does it really mean? Beyond the feelings and beyond the public relations that sometimes we are good at, what does it really mean to be together in this journey of life through different seasons? I recently lost my older brother to COVID. Um, again, somebody I thought would do life uh, until we're in our 80s or 90s. Didn't happen. By God's grace, uh, even as we buried him, um, there were no regrets on my side. I didn't feel, you know, oh, I wish I had done this or done that for him. Uh, my most recent memories were hosting the family home, lots of laughter, jokes, recalling the past, our growing up, and so on. So in that sense, I felt a sense of comfort that I had not squandered uh, that relationship that God had given me with my own brother. So it, it does not have to be just Christian friends. Even siblings are important. So here we go. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, the background of this, of course, is the slaying of Goliath by this young, uh, unknown individual uh, who later will emerge to be David, the son of Jesse, um, who nobody knows at that point. In fact, at the time that he slays the giant, King Saul is going to ask Abner, his commander-in-chief of the army, whose son is this young man? And, and Abner will say, as sure as the Lord lives, I do not know. No one knows him. He's a nobody. But the rise of David will be well chronicled in the book of Samuel as we see the hand of God upon him and as he becomes, unknown to many people, the greatest king of all time. So he's just finished slaying Goliath. David is speaking. I mean, the King Saul is going to speak with him. Um, but after this, uh, David finishes speaking with, with the king. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, who is the son to the king, he's a prince, apparent, heir to the throne. Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. It's almost 
a, a pre-Christian statement that is made. Christianity is not yet come into view at this point, but it's like these guys have received the command from Christ ahead of time, and they are living out the Christian basics way before it is actually commanded or demanded of them. The interesting thing about this statement is that the person who takes the initiative uh, to, to initiate the friendship is the one who has the least to gain from it. Jonathan is son of Saul. He's king. He's heir apparent. He's king in waiting. So he, he doesn't lack anything. Not power, not wealth, not prestige. Actually, he is the first prince of Israel. Why? Because Saul is the first king of Israel. The monarchy has just been inaugurated. Before this, they had people like Samuel and the judges before that. So the monarchy is something very new. And so this new prestige and this new glory um, is being experienced by, the, by this. This is the first, first family in Israel. So it's very prestigious. But Jonathan initiates a friendship, quote-unquote, with a nobody. David himself will say, I'm a poor man's son. You know, who am I? Because later on, King Saul is going to propose that he become his son-in-law. And he says, who am I uh, to be in-laws with a king? I can't. I'm a poor man. And so Jonathan initiates this friendship, which is interesting. It's easy to see how that would play out if David is the one who's seeking Jonathan's attention because he has everything to gain from the relationship. Access to power, access to wealth, access to fame and prestige, which is the world's way of doing things. But when somebody who doesn't need anything is the one lifting you up and granting you favor, um, that's a whole different thing. So here it is. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. It introduces the language of covenant. And covenant goes beyond just a casual commitment. You're saying, hey, look, this is not surface level stuff. I'm not being casual about who I want you to be in my life. I want this to go deeper. I want it to last longer. And I want it to be meaningful for both of us. It's the language that we use in marriage. The language of covenant. Again, it's unprecedented in just a friendship. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. His weapons of defense. Almost making a statement, before you, I don't need to defend myself. When it comes to this relationship, I will not watch my back because I don't expect you to stab me in the back. I want you to watch my back. When you are there, then I have nothing to worry about. I can proceed with my business knowing that my best friend has my back. It speaks to the quality of friendship. And again, I want us to mull about this. What kind of a friend am I? What kind of a friend am I? Can I be trusted? Or am I waiting in the shadows for an opportunity to pounce on somebody who thinks they are my friend, but at the point that they are most vulnerable, I destroy them? Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens. Of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time 
on. Saul kept a jealous eye on David. This is going to be interesting. And, and, and for me, it speaks about the choices that we make. Here's Jonathan, the son of Saul, willing to make a spiritual covenant with David about their friendship. Here is his father, the king, who has all the power and the, and the prestige, but who is jealous of David. And, and Jonathan will be forced to make some interesting choices. Goes back to the question of loyalty. And it's interesting that Jonathan will choose a path very different from his father, meaning we do have a choice. Sometimes we like to make this comment that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, but that's probably true of trees, but not of humans. <laughs> because humans have the ability to make a choice. And though Saul could be the most evil guy, Jonathan doesn't have to follow suit. He can make a choice, and so can you. So we can't always say that, you know, I came from this kind of a family. Us guys, we know how to betray. <laughs> you can't make those excuses. In fact, every bad experience that you have can be an opportunity to make a different choice and decide, you know what? I saw what jealousy did in destroying my family. I choose to be different. I choose to be supportive. I choose to have godly values to determine the kind of relationships that I will have going forward. Those are choices we can make. That's a choice that Jonathan made. So the story continues. So the next day, an evil spirit, I mean in verse 10, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house. Look at this weird statement. This guy is prophesying, yeah? While David was playing the harp as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it saying to himself, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. See, he's a guy who's prophesying. So he's looking very spiritual. You know? And within no time, he has a spear, he has it, he actually intends to murder David. So it's not the things, it's not everything that we observe on the surface that really should make us make a judgment about how spiritual or unspiritual you are. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them. So, you could be speaking spiritual things and speaking very loudly. Somebody says, what you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Why? Because your actions actually tell me what's really going on inside. Your anger, your jealousy, your sabotage, Tells me, uh-uh, all is not well. All is not well. So here is Saul, completely consumed with jealousy and anger against David. And he wants to kill him. But David eludes him. Saul was afraid of David. Because the Lord was with David, but he had left Saul. A lot of the things that we do can actually tell us what is our real spiritual state. If the Lord is with you, then your actions will tell us that the Lord is with you. But if he has left you, then your actions will tell us, surely, somebody else indwells you. And it is not the Lord. Because the action of destruction, killing, destroying, that comes from the enemy, not from God. God has come that we might have life and have it to the full. 
But the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So in the question of friendship, what do you do with those that God has put around you? Are you protective of them? When you hear something about them, do you jump to add to the fire? Or do you say, hey, hang on. I think I know the gentleman pretty well. No, no, I know her. No, I don't think that's true. That cannot be the whole story. Or are you quick to say, hey, tell me more. Hiya, even him, he did like that. He, 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 and the way I think he, I thought he was a good person. And you go on to destroy, to slander. Relationships take years and time and effort to build, but they can be destroyed in just a sentence. Don't be that one who does. Don't be the one who's destroying. Be the one who builds. Be the one who protects. Be the one who gives the benefit of doubt, at least until you have access to more information. So Saul is afraid. Again, fear doesn't come from God. Why are you afraid? Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had left Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him a command of a, a thousand men. And David led the troops in the campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. Look at the fallacy of trying to destroy the success that God is giving somebody simply because Saul is jealous of him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. This is the manipulation of the enemy. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul said to David, here is my older daughter Merab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that for me. So everything that Saul is doing is to set up David for failure. Including giving his own daughter-in-law. I mean his own daughter to be married by David. Not because he loves David. Because he hates him. This is how twisted sometimes the enemy can make us if we are not careful in terms of our relationship. Using his own daughter as a snare for, for David. But David said to Saul, who am I and what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Merab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Meholah. Because David declined. Now, Saul's daughter, Michal, was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. Completely twisted. Can't even be happy for his own daughter to be married unless there's some political advantage to destroy David. Then Saul ordered his attendants, speak to David privately and say, look, the king is pleased with you and his attendants are uh, all like you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servant told him what David had said, Saul replied, say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. So he sends him with this crazy um, requirement. Uh, to kill these hundred Philistines, so hoping that in the heat of the battle, David will get slayed. 
when the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the allotted time had elapsed, David and his men went out and killed 200, not even 100. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then, David gave him, uh, then Saul gave him his daughter Michal in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. Now, is that necessary? Here was a wonderful opportunity for King Saul to raise a son-in-law, powerful and valiant, one who went and fought the battles of God, won prestige for Israel, and obviously the king would get the, the, the accolades for the conquest and the expansion of his territories. But because of his own personal character issues, his ungodliness, he couldn't see the things that God was doing for Israel. He makes an enemy out of somebody who has God's favor. He uses his own daughters for political leverage so as to destroy David. Very, very unfortunate indeed. It could have been better, it could have been otherwise. Let me go to chapter 19. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David and warned him. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. This is where Jonathan makes his own choices. And he decides, you know what? I can't go with that plan. It's ungodly. You can't kill a man whom God is using for his purposes. And in order to bring prestige to our own nation and to your own kingship, so he says, I'm not going to do it. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I will speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. So one of the elements about love is loyalty. And here, Jonathan chooses to be loyal to David rather than side with the evil plan of his father. So, and so he goes and tells David, this is the plan. You're going to be killed. But look, I have influence over my father. Let me talk to him. I think I can change his mind. And David is not worried at this point because he knows Jonathan and I have a covenant. And the covenant is in the Lord. Because unless you bring God in the middle of your negotiations, in the middle of your plans then even you cannot trust your own motives, the motives of your heart. The Bible says that the heart is deceptive. Even we can deceive ourselves about our intentions. But when God is mediator in terms of our covenant, our agreements, our friendships, then we are safe because God will keep us safe. So he goes and negotiates this. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his own hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for Israel. And you saw it and were glad. Come on, wake up, dad. Can't you see? This is not our enemy. This is our friend. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? I'll not be part of this murder plot. And here's the thing. Sometimes we think that, I mean, it could have been easy to think, well, Jonathan, you're the next in line. You're going to be king as well. This is your father. Surely blood is thicker than water, right? So side with your father. You know, get rid of David. But I think when it comes to covenants with God, we draw the line somewhere. And we know that if this relationship with, let's even say my husband or my wife, is going to lead us to sin against God, then this is where I draw the line. I'm saying, hey, sweetheart, I'm not going ahead with this plan. This is not right. God will not bless what we are trying to do here. Okay, let's, let's come out clean. I'm, I'm not supportive of this. 
You know, maybe if Sapphira had that kind of common sense, she would have saved the family or the lineage. You remember the Ananias and Sapphira story? She went along with a lie. But there are places to draw a line and say, yes, I know, we are married. But our covenant is before God, and God doesn't allow murder. God doesn't allow theft. I'm not doing this. Let's draw a line here. Let's be clear. And you're doing that not selfishly. It's actually selflessly for the preservation of your family. Later on, in many years to come, Abigail would know where to draw the line because her husband, Nabal, had dealt foolishly with David and his men. They had enjoyed the protection out in the bushes where David had protected the flock and the wealth of Nabal. But when it came to a time of gratitude, Nabal insulted David and his men, calling them a bunch of riffraff. And David was so angry, he told his men, come, may the Lord deal with me. If by morning there will be one single male remaining in Nabal's household. Abigail had this. And she decided, hey, this is where we draw the line. She took all the gifts and the, some cakes and loaves of bread and intercepted David before he could come to destroy the family of Nabal. And she dealt wisely in that moment because she knew the Lord would give David victory and Nabal's family, including herself, would be destroyed. You must know where to draw the line. Loyalty doesn't mean foolish, foolishly following up with Anything that is said simply because it has come from my best friend, my spouse. No. God is God. You draw the line there. And if God doesn't allow it, neither should you. And it could be that your good judgment is what could easily save the family. This is what Jonathan was trying to do here. I'm not going on with your murder plot. We're not killing David. He has done nothing wrong. In fact, what he has done has brought benefit and glory to your monarchy. And so you cannot do this, Dad. This is not right. Let's be wise. So then, Jonathan speaks well to his father regarding David. Saul listened to Jonathan and took his oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So here, Jonathan is actually the one canceling the father, although it should be the other way around. And the father is able to see sense and at this point stop his madness. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before. So this is previously... You know, in the last episode, David had held a spear. You know, I mean, Saul had held a spear trying to pin David. Now, now David is back in Saul's court, serving as before, because Jonathan, a wise and godly young man, the prince, has intervened, negotiated, and told him, hey, this, this guy is good for you. And the irony is that at the time that Saul is trying to kill David, David is playing the harp because an evil spirit has inflicted Saul and it's only through this music that he's going to get relief. You're trying to destroy the very person that is helping you, that is bringing healing to you. But jealousy and, 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 and evil can cause us to be completely blind about even the people that God has put around us that are benefiting us, that are blessing us. And a voice in your head is saying, this is your enemy. And he takes the wise counsel of a Jonathan to bring back sanity to King Saul. Once more, war broke out and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled from before him. So the benefits and the blessings for Israel continue because God is using David in his valiant um, bravery to subdue all the enemies of King Saul. But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. I think I would have told David, just take the spear and hide it. This guy with a spear is not good for you. Or when you play the harp, make sure the spear is not anywhere near. <laughs> 
While David was playing the harp, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with a spear. Again. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. I think he knew now this is for real. So Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. This is while he's still married to his daughter. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So again, the benefits of God and the blessings of God is that God has put the very people around Saul's own family to be David's protectors. So Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, he is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in, in the bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered there, there was the idol in the bed under the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? In other words, he threatened me with, with death. So she has to lie to cover for David. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naioth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naioth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they prophesied. Saul was told about it. And then he sent more men and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern of Seku. And he said, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naioth, Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naioth at Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naioth. He stripped off his robes and also prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay that way all that day and night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? So... God is making a mockery of Saul and his leadership. It takes God to hijack evil missions, put his spirit there, and instead of doing the works of evil, they start prophesying. These are people who assassins that have been sent to kill David. And even he himself, thinking that now I'll deal with it myself, God takes him over. Almost God having to go to extreme measures to contain this evil that is pent up inside Saul's heart. I say the story speaks for itself, but my question is one. I still ask, what kind of a friend are you? And we have two extremes from the same family. King Saul, hell-bent on evil hell-bent on maintaining his prestige, his monarchy, even though God has rejected it. So he thinks he can advance himself through his own means. But here is Jonathan, the heir apparent, the one who had most to lose by, Kate, by supporting David. Because if David becomes king, it means Jonathan never makes it to the throne. But that doesn't matter to him. In his discernment, he says, the Lord is with David. And if this is the Lord's will, I will not oppose it. I will support it. And he decides to make an alliance against his own father, against his flesh and blood, to do what God has purposed should happen. And he aligns himself with David and becomes his protector. He becomes his mediator. He becomes his negotiator. At a great loss to himself. I think that's the price of true friendship. He doesn't count what he's losing. He doesn't count the wrath of his father, which we will see next week. And he counts all that as nothing. 
At one point, he will almost lose his life. I say this is, these two guys are a taste of pre-Christianity before Christianity ever came into vogue. For greater love has no man than this, that he lay his own life for his friend's sake. This is what Jonathan is saying. You know what? I'm meant to be king. I'm laying it down. You know what? I'm going to support you. My dad wants to kill you. He has the power. He has the authority. But you know what? Let me be mediator between you and him. You know? Let me negotiate this space for you. And then after I've negotiated it, I'll bring you and take you back into the king's court. Then you can serve us before. Think about this in the weeks to come. Take stock, if you like, of the people that God has gifted you with. Who has he put around you? What relationships do you have with your brothers, your sisters, if you have any? Is there peace in the household? In this uh, uncommon season of COVID, if that person was to be taken from your life, would there be regrets? Would you wish that you had made amends? Would you wish that you had sat down and talked about that conflict that causes you not to talk with each other anymore? Would you have apologized? Would you say, you know what, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever happened, happened. You know what, it's just money. Forget it. I'm writing it off. Don't even pay me back. I don't need it. I think I do need it. But you know what, it, 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 it doesn't matter. Okay, it matters, but it doesn't matter that much. Okay? It doesn't matter enough that you and I are no longer in talking terms. That is more painful and difficult for me than what I have had to forego in terms of what money can buy. This relationship, I can't purchase it. So I, I need you back as my friend, as my brother. Because you know what? God thinks that this relationship is worth it. He died for it. And, and I think you and I need to value it the same way. Would you consider? Take stock of those people around your life where conflict has been the normal narrative. And just tell, you know, God, I'm, I'm giving you up. I'm choosing you. I'm choosing your way. I'll, I'll do the Jonathan thing. And I'll bring my friend back to the fold, even at a cost to myself. Because where you're concerned, this relationship matters to God. Would you do that this week? Make an actual stop and write down those names. The ones that you find difficult even to pronounce now. Make that right.